let's get started. Whoa, that was nice and sharp, huh? Let's get started, you guys. All right. Let's see, any announcements we need to pass along at all? Can we turn the volume down just a little bit? Top, bottom left there? Yeah, bottom left just a little bit. Test, 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 one, two, there's a little bit better there, perfect, right there. All right, okay, any announcements that we need to make today to pass along, any church announcements? Uh, this Wednesday, what's on the menu, anybody know what's on the menu for this Wednesday? For chicken and mashed potatoes. I know this last week was, was awesome. So that's at 5.30 to 6.15. And then we have uh, Vespers at 6.30. Yep, 6.30 to about 7.15. Okay. All right. So let's uh, jump into thing. I don't. I'm just trying to think. I don't think there's any other new. No oh, the the sound system. I mentioned the eight o'clock service. The sound system is in. Um, I didn't get. A, I only had about 20 minutes with the guy to go over some of the basics. He showed me a bunch of things. And I just remembered how to turn it on today, so I was happy about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but we had a little bit of an echoey sound, and I, I I was thinking through, and it was the receiver up front was putting too much. Uh, power to the back of the board. So we adjusted that for the second service. So we'll be tweaking it. We're gonna get Ellis on there. Um, we'll get we'll get Nate on there. Uh, the neat thing is our new sound system, you can actually have a, a tablet, an Apple tablet, and from your tablet you can make adjustments on it. So you know we can hand that to somebody if you don't like the sermon, you just turn the volume down, right? <laughs> You're listening like, oh this is a good part. I want my neighbor to hear it. You turn it up, right? <laughs> so um, but yeah we'll we'll be fine tuning that. It's always a work in progress. Uh, It'll be better than what we've had before, and uh, we will not have the uh, air raid siren, uh, the, the, the bomb siren that goes off on the sound system. We don't turn it on anymore, so that's good, okay? All right, so <clears throat> today we are in our topical study. Um, as, as we mentioned, once a month we're going to be going through a topical study. How these topics are, are discussed is that we have a part of our elder meeting. Uh, we'll be having an elder meeting today. We discuss the different topics that we want to hit as a church. So I actually consult the elders, the elders give feedback, and the elders will help choose the theme for the month. And so then that's what the theme of the um, uh, of the newsletter is going to be. And then we have our topical study uh, tied in. So then we'll have the newsletter and this tied in the same thing. And so the theme for this month of March, I was gonna say February, wow, the month of March is the church militant. We talked briefly about the church militant and uh, wanted to kind of explain exactly what it is. But before we jump into things, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start jumping into this here, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are not the Church of Ease, that we're the Church Militant. We thank you that we have a bold confession, we have truth, we have integrity because we have you. Thank you for this. May we ever be captive to your word, shape and form us according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, as I mentioned before, uh, we said the church militant versus the church of ease. One of the concerns um, that we visit with the elder board is that we should probably define what does it mean to be church militant. You know, we hear the word militant and we automatically think what? We think of a bunker, we think of guns and grenades, and so is that who we are as the church? You know, should we start packing our AR-15s on our back as we come into church? Uh, yeah, I, I, I like guns. I just bought a gun here this last week, so I like guns. But uh, is that what it means to be church militant? Uh, not exactly. Okay, so we're going to explore this topic and uh, came across a couple neat metaphors for the church uh, from a Catholic priest. But I'm going to actually uh, uh, disagree with both of his metaphors and lay forth a uh, better metaphor, I would say, that captures the church being militant. Okay. All right, so for the starts, let's just talk about this. What does it mean to be militant? The word militant means fighting or warring is a word that communicates a combative character. On the other hand, the word ease means comfortable and free from pain, worry, or agitation. So as you can recall, we, we hit this a couple weeks ago between the church militant and the church of ease, which was from some writings from CFW Walther, and his assertion was a church of ease is a worthless church. It is what? Like lukewarm. 
And so the whole passage about being lukewarm is lukewarm water is useless. Uh, this comes from the book of Revelation. He talks about one of the churches, the seven churches, and he says, if you're lukewarm, I spit you out. In other words, hot water is good for something, right? You can take, you know, a good bath with hot water. Uh, cold water is refreshing to drink. It's useful, but lukewarm water, it's useless. And so a church of ease is like lukewarm, okay? Um, and so again, Walther stated that the church is not the church of ease, but it's the church militant. So then that brings up the great question, what are we militant against? What does it mean to be militant? As indicated by the Lord's Prayer, as well as Scripture, the Christian's three adverse adversaries are the old Adam, the devil, and the influences of the world. Okay, so consider this for a moment. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, we are actually praying against our three enemies. Okay, so let's just consider that for a second. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy be my name. Right? My kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? We don't pray like that. Okay, our Father, who art in heaven, holy be the state's name. May the kingdom of the world come. May the will of the world be done. Right? We don't pray that either. And so we're praying against, in the Lord's Prayer, we're praying against our three enemies of the world, the devil, and the old Adam. Those are our three enemies. They have long been held to be our three enemies. In church history, theologians have uh, developed and fleshed this out, that these are our three main enemies. But we also see these enemies clearly defined in Scripture. So if you look at Galatians 5, if you have your Bibles, Galatians 5, okay, New Testament, okay, Galatians 5, okay, Galatians 5. 19 through 21, okay? Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Okay? And so we see that the old Adam uh, brings forth nothing but sin. So, technically stated, your old Adam can't not sin. The old Adam will only sin. Okay? You cannot reform the old Adam. The new man in Christ, the new creation in Christ can't sin. The new creation will only do righteous things under the impulses of the Holy Spirit. But because you have, what, an old Adam and you are a new creation at the same time simultaneously... All of your actions are going to be simultaneously just and evil at the same time. Okay? So if you're going to do a good work, you will be doing the good work from the case of the new creation out of a righteous endeavor to serve your neighbor. And at the same exact same time, your old Adam will flare up and say, look what I'm doing. And so all of our motives, we would be lying to ourselves if we would say our motives are pure. Our motives are never pure as Christians. They're never pure. There's always the old Adam lurking in our what? In our works. That makes sense? Okay. Uh, so the old Adam is always lurking in that. And we see that at the same time. So we have the, 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 the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and the old Adam are always at a constant war in the Christian until the day that we die. Okay. You ever think of it that way? That uh, we have simultaneously uh, two agendas at all times? I've told you many times when I stand in the pulpit, I make the sign of the cross, and I say, Lord, may this sermon be a blessing to this congregation, and also may I look good. Right? Every Sunday. Make sure Lord your You know, and so, um, you know, and I, I, I've told people that, you know, uh, don't say a good sermon. Uh, say, 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 God be praised for the gospel. Somebody comes through and says, God be praised for the gospel. And I think, huh, they like the sermon. <laughs> right? you know? So the old Adam is always in the details, always working. And so it's very, very, um, very naive of us to think that our motives are entirely pure. There's always the hidden agenda of the old Adam, okay, until the day we die. Now, does that mean that we don't do good works? No, we do good works. And as we're doing good works, we repent of our old Adam trying to seize that good work for its own endeavor. 
okay? At the same time, all right? So the devil himself, check out 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Somebody want to read 1 Corinthians 7, 5? Uh, actually, hold on a second. Uh, I think I got the wrong verse there. Uh, he... Yeah, that's that's it. Yep, that's it. Yep, so we want to read First Corinthians seven five. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self control. All right. So the emphasis is there is that Satan tempts, right? We have we have numerous verses in the uh, scriptures that talk about the temptation of the evil one. And the main way that the, the, the devil tempts is to what? Lie. Uh, he lies and he what? Dangles poison in front of us, sweet poison, and tells us it tastes good. Now, also keep in mind, 1 Peter 5, 8, let's talk about that. So the devil absolutely tempts us, as we hear there. And 1 Peter 5, 8, what do we hear there? Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Yeah. So he looks to devour, to kill, steal, and destroy your faith. Um, it also, Scripture also says that the devil is what? He masquerades as an angel of light. So we have to be very, very careful. Um, I think naiveness will make us think that the devil always comes with what? A red cape and a pointy pitchfork labeled spicy. Um, the devil does not come that way, typically speaking. The devil comes as an angel of light looking good. And so, um, again, I think I think when we think of evil, we automatically think of fire and burning cars, and we think of, uh, you know, darkness and, 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 and foul smell and badness and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I would say that the majority of the time when the devil works, he works as an angel of light. He actually disguises his evil as good, which we covered a couple of weeks ago. All the devil has to do is what? turn just a little bit, inject just a little bit of yeast into the leaven, and it what? Leavens the whole lump. Okay? Alright, so we see the old Adam is against us. The devil tempts us. He's looking to devour. Okay? And the influences of the world. This is cool. Okay? Check out Colossians 2.8. Colossians 2.8. So we're going to turn to the left in our Bibles. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and then according to human tradition. According to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Yeah. So, we talk about empty philosophies. Now, there's two kinds of philosophies. There is a philosophy according to human tradition, but there's also a philosophy according to Christ. Okay? So, a philosophy is not necessarily bad. A philosophy according to Christ is good. It's true. Uh, with understanding who we are in Christ, we can understand the good, the true, and the beautiful. But a philosophy according to mankind can most certainly be what? Uh, divisive. It can be very what? Deceptive. Okay? So again, we see right there in Scripture, we see our three enemies. There's going to be what? The devil, the world, and the old Adam. Okay? So we also see these three adversaries in the temptation of Jesus in Matthew 4. Tempting Jesus to cast himself off the pinnacle the world, stones to bread, flesh, and the worship of Satan, the devil. So we see it right there in Matthew 4, the, the, the uh, three enemies. Ephesians 2, 2 through 3a captures all three of these enemies as well, saying, you once walked following the course of this world, right there, following the prince of the power of the air, there we go, there's the devil, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we, um, not sure what that word is there, that got cut off there, all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Okay? So we see all of our three enemies there. Okay? So succinctly stated, as we teach in our confirmation class, the three enemies are going to be the devil. Again, repeating it, the devil, the world, and the old Adam. Okay? So if we're a militant, we're militant against those three. Okay? So those are our enemies. Okay? Right there, stated clearly. Okay? So I'm going to pause there. Thoughts on that uh, feedback, insights? Would be more effective to call the old Adam the Antichrist. Yeah, um, the old Adam is Antichrist, Antichristian. Our, our old Adam, 
Now keep in mind, remember that uh, Donald Barnhouse quote that I shared from you from the 1950s? Uh, it's, it's, it's a great, it was on the CBS or ABC radio. It was CBS, I believe, Donald, Donald Barnhouse. He was a news announcer for CBS radio. And he started off his address on the radio. He said, what would it look like if Satan overtook your city, right? And I've used this numerous times in sermons and Bible studies. It's just so, so good. He said, uh, what would it look like if Satan overtook Minot? Now, we would think, you know, automatically, we would think, what, anarchy? We'd think, what? We'd think burning cars. We'd think smashed windows. We would see trash and needles on the road. I mean, we'd think all that, right? But Donald Barnhouse says this. He says, if the devil were to take over your city, the streets would be pristine clean. All the bars would be shut down. No strip joints. Right? No drugs. Uh, the little boys and girls would say, Hi, sir. Hello, ma'am. And he said, Churches would be full. They'd be full. You come to church. Not a single parking lot. There'd be people standing in the back of the church where Christ is not preached. That's the point. Uh, if we don't have Christ, we don't have the forgiveness of sins, we don't have a church. It doesn't matter how morally good. The devil doesn't care about good morals. Or bad morals. He cares about Christ. So if he can get a bunch of people doing good morals without Jesus, he has them right where he wants them. That makes sense? And so if we have a squeaky clean church without Christ, uh, we're an anti-Christ church. Okay? It's that simple. Must be Christ and him crucified. Okay? So, good point. Any other thoughts on this? The, the allure of the flesh and the devil, they never disappoint for quite a while. They, they look good and they feel good until you're so far in that it's hard to get out. Yeah. Whereas the Christian message is come, suffer, repent, die of yourself every day with us. That's a sales pitch right there. Yep. Yep. Uh, there is, now he's a Calvinist. He's a, a Calvinist. I, I, I have friends that are Calvinists. Uh, but he wrote this book, um, R.C. Sproul wrote a book once, and I can't recall what it was, The Poison Cup? Serenity here? Is it The Poison Cup? It's, it's, this, it's this fictitious story where uh, they come to this big, big uh, spring of water, and the water is so good, it tastes so sweet, and people were just drinking it to the max. And they loved it. Everybody that came to the town, like, you got to taste this water. It's so good. And they would drink the water. And it was sweet poison. And the whole premise of the story was they were drinking poison and not knowing it. And it was so sweet. And they were elevating it and promoting it and talking about it. And they loved that was the highlight of their town was this sweet, sweet water, not knowing deep, deep, deep what that it was poison. It was long term was what hurting them. And so, again, keep in mind that people do not sin in order to what? Ruin their lives. We sin because we think it will advance our lives. So the person that comes along and says, hmm, I'm going to take this illegal substance so I can rot my teeth out, destroy my brain, and end up dying at, you know, 21 years old in the hospital. They don't do it for that reason. Okay? Uh, be very naive to think that. Uh, when we sin, we usually do it to advance ourselves. We drink the sweet poison thinking it's good for us, but in the end it comes back to bite us, which is the reason why we need to be captive to the Word of God to discern through the sweetness, to discern what is poison and what is not. That makes sense? Okay? So if we're driven by our faith, you know, in fact, we we're talking about this at our men's Bible study, I believe, this last week. When a culture has, get this here, when a culture has as its God, a hedonistic God. Now, we've covered the word hedonism before. You guys can recall what hedonism was? Hedonism says this. If it makes you happy and it gives you pleasure, it is good. If it makes you feel bad and you suffer, it is bad. So our world right now in America has a hedonistic God. Everything is to please you in the here and the now. All of our marketing is what? Buy this product and you'll be happy. And we have a bunch of people trying to catch the carrot on the end of the stick, trying to get all these new things. And when they get it, they get a they get a high, they get an excitement. They're they're what they have pleasure. And then what happens if there's any suffering? What happens? They fall away, right? So if you think about it, the Christian suffering, they would look at being a Christian and suffering. They would consider that what good or bad, bad. 
But as we look at it, we're going to hear in the sermon today, many times the Lord does send us afflictions. Psalm 119 talks about this, that the Lord will send us afflictions at time in order to what? To drive us back to him, in order to grind out fear, in order for us to what? To, to expose our idols and drive us back to him many times. But if your God is a hedonistic God of pleasure, any kind of pain whatsoever, you're going to what? Leave. You're going to run from. So unfortunately, I think our culture in a lot of ways is trapped with a hedonistic God of seeking pleasure at all costs. And anything with suffering is considered evil and they run from it, our culture. Okay? That makes sense? All right. Okay, so let's talk about this metaphor. This is really fun. The metaphor of the church militant. Okay, a metaphor for the church militant. A cruise ship or a battleship. There have been many metaphors used for the church over the years. For example, the church is not a country club for saints, but a hospital for sinners. You've heard that before. Okay. Um, the church, it is a sail ship or a lighthouse. Okay. Other metaphors include seeing the church as a community, a body, a household, people and the bread, and so forth. We have all these different metaphors for we describe in the church. Now, I, I, this popped up here several years ago, and I saw it circulating on, online. A recent clever metaphor came forth from a Catholic priest. He asked, is the church a cruise ship or a battleship? With respect to a cruise ship, people will ask, okay, so let's just, when I say cruise ship, what am I talking about? A lux, yeah, yeah, a, a carnival cruise line. Uh, Mrs. Richard, uh, well, okay, back in the day when we got married, it been about almost 24 years ago, um, we didn't have any money. We we're poor, so we didn't have money to go on a big honeymoon. So we said, we'll go on our five year anniversary. Five year anniversary came, we still didn't have any money, so we didn't go. <laughs> so we said, okay, well, 10 year anniversary. 10 year anniversary, she was pregnant. And uh, so we're like, that's not going to happen. Okay. So then finally, uh, she approached me. She said, "Hey, uh, Matt, let's let's go on this Carnival cruise line." And I'm like, "I'm like, I just been trapped on a boat with a bunch of people. I just uh. she goes, goes to a theological conference on a cruise line. Like, I'm I'm in. You know? <laughs> what a geek, what a dork, huh? And uh, so we went on a Carnival cruise line. I kid you not, everything was delivered to you. I mean, they they made your bed. They took your little towels, right? And they made little animals out of your towels. I mean, it was it was and the the food was. Perfect. Everything was brought to you. And I, 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 the only thing that they were lacking is they should have had some sort of chair that could just wheeled me around to each event. I could just lay there with a pina colada, right? You know? Uh, but but it is a luxurious, luxur luxurious cruise is what we're talking about. So is the church like a battleship or is it like a cruise ship? What do, what do I mean by battleship? Let's describe that. What do we think when we hear battleship? Yeah, Artillery, metal, right? Conflict. Uh, I think I think uh, of the models I used to make as a kid. These battleship, these huge guns, right? And you have seen those bullets. I mean, these bullets are probably you know like this tall, and like you know, and these huge packs of gunpowder that they pack in there, and then boom, and the whole ship kind of shakes when it shoots, right? So we think of it that way. So the the priest comes back and he asks this question with respect to the church: Is the church a cruise ship or a battleship? With respect to the cruise ship, people will ask all the following questions. So if we see the church as a cruise ship, here's what we're going to talk about. This is what we're going to ask ourselves. Do I like the music that they play in the ballroom? Right? So if it's a cruise ship, is the music good? Right? Um, do I like the captain and his crew? Is the service good? Am I well fed? Are my needs being promptly met? Is the cruise pleasant? Am I comfortable? Do I want to cruise with them again? How often do we approach the church that way? Unfortunately, we do, right? Uh, unfortunately, we do. We look at it, it's like, well, I didn't like the music today, or I didn't like the liturgy today. Uh, captain of the crew, well, you know, I don't know about the staff, right? Uh, am I well fed? Am I, my needs met promptly, you know? Did I, did I feel good and happy in the church, right? So that kind of mentality uh, is going to see, you're actually seeing the church as a cruise ship, okay? Obviously, the metaphor of the cruise ship displays a church of ease, right? A church of ease. Okay, now, the priest goes on to contrast the cruise ship with the battleship. With the battleship, people will ask the following questions. 
Is the ship on a clear and noble mission? Is the ship able to endure storms at sea? Does the, ca does the captain submit to a higher authority? Are the tactics and moves of the enemy well understood by the crew? Does the crew have proper training and experience? Are the crew members equipped to succeed? Does the crew cooperate with the captain and other leaders? Are they taught to be disciplined and vigilant? Are they at their posts? Do they take the battle seriously? Does the ship have adequate first aid and medical help? Is the crew properly able to distinguish lesser threats from greater ones? Okay, so that's going to be the battleship. You hear the difference there? Uh, I would say that the difference between the two, and I think the priest is on to something on this here, and I, I don't entirely agree, but he's on to something. What's the difference between the cruise line and the battleship? The battleship presumes and understands that the enemy is out there to destroy. The cruise does not have any enemies. You see what I'm saying? There's no threat. If you're on a cruise line, you don't go on a cruise line thinking you're going to be what, boarded by a bunch of pirates. You usually don't. You feel safety. You feel everything's good. But a battleship is on high alert because you have an enemy that's seeking to destroy you. So then the mentality shifts and changes. Okay? Now, since these are not my illustrations, we can dissect it. What do you guys think of those two illustrations? Like, dislike, favorable, unfavorable? So the priest actually is saying that the church is like a battleship. What are your thoughts? Well, as you compare it to the armor of God, I would say yes. Yeah. If he's not, I would say no. <clears throat> yeah. Battleship and a cruise ship. Yeah. You guys like the metaphors? Just like the metaphors? What are you thinking of those? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I, I kind of like the battle me metaphor, but, but as I got thinking about it a little more deeply, as we're thinking about this church militant, what does it mean to be militant as a church? Um, it occurred to me on a different metaphor, which is a biblical metaphor that we actually use here at St. Paul's, okay? So with the battleship metaphor is a much healthier metaphor than a cruise ship, but it's still lacking, I would say. The reason being, where is God in the metaphor of the battleship? Okay, seeing the church militant as Noah's Ark. At the beginning of our baptismal liturgy, there's a flood prayer, okay? This prayer was written by Martin Luther in the 1500s. It was not included in the earlier hymnals of the LCMS, but the more recent LSB, it was introduced. So if you look at our baptismal liturgy, in our baptismal liturgy, we talk about two floods, so two acts of water. We talk about the Red Sea, and we talk about Noah and the Ark. And it talks about how the waters of the Red Sea drowned hard-hearted Pharaoh and his enemies, and how that Red Sea water saved what? The Israelites as they were walking through it. Then he also talks about in the flood prayer, he talks about uh, the waters of the uh, flood of Noah, how it washed over the land, okay, decimating um, all evil. And then through that ark, the uh, eight souls and all were saved and delivered from that massive flood. And so this was reintroduced, and I'm not sure why we didn't have it in our earlier hymnal, uh, our first two hymnals in the Missouri Senate, our English hymnals. Uh, but it was introduced here just recently at our Burgundy Hymnal, which I think is, is good. It dates all the way back to the 1500s. Luther included it. He considered it a very, very important prayer in understanding baptism. Okay? So in the prayer, Martin Luther emphasized Moses and the Red Sea as well as Noah and the Flood. Luther's emphasis was to stress how muddy water drowns evil. Furthermore, in the Flood prayer, Luther emphasized the Ark. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one who keeps believers safe in the Holy Ark, the church, until the Lord returns. To the point, the Ark is a much better metaphor for the church, better than a cruise ship or a battleship. Okay, so have you thought about it that way? Uh, one of the things in St. Paul's here, what I like about our ceiling, when you look up, people look up and they always say to me, what? Looks like a bottom of a boat. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But to think of the church as an Ark... What are your thoughts on that? When I say the church is an ark, how does that make you feel? Just talk about, I mean, seriously, just talk about what, 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 what emotions does that conjure up when the church is an ark? I think that's a pretty cool idea. If we went to the ark, yeah. my, my most fantastic part of the ark was just thinking how when that door was shut. When it was shut. They were locked, they were locked in, they were sealed in. They were sealed they in. Were sealed into the church. Sealed into the church. Hey, you guys hear that? When the door was shut... 
Okay, now that door being shut was twofold. It was for those on the outside, it was what? They couldn't get in. Yep, they couldn't get in. It was condemnation, right? The wrath of God. But for those on the inside, it was what? Security, safety. Uh, as I think of the ark of the church, when I go into the sanctuary, even though I'm being a pastor up front, usually in the opening hymn, I just take a deep breath. <sighs> I can just rest with the flock. We're in the ark together. We get to hear the word. I get to participate in the liturgy with you. And we are safe in the ark. Okay? We're in the ark of the church. Okay? All I think of both the Red Sea and the Ark is chaos. Inside the boat and outside the boat. I mean, the, this realization is when protection is happening, it's in the month's chaos. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't think of any company. Besides being out of the water, the chaos was still affecting the people inside that ark. But it's very realistic, is it not? Look at our churches. Yep. Know, is there not chaos within our church too? Well, our churches are perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've got we've got chaos amongst one another. We've got chaos just amongst us in the world and our central nature. It's all in here because we're simultaneously sitting there. Yeah. So that chaos that he's describing, we still have it. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the earth? It's, it's good stuff. Uh, I go back to the, the cruise ship. Uh, that's the, the idea of being on a cruise ship is a denial of reality, a denial of suffering. It's demonic in nature because it turns every. I'm not saying it to anybody. <laughs> okay, so so it, cruises are dear carnival <laughs> cruise line. <laughs> It's satanic in that it turns us in on ourselves. Turns us in on ourselves, I would agree, yep. And as opposed to a battleship where we serve our neighbors. Um, but it, 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 it's a narcissistic uh, denial of reality. Yep. It's a fantasy. It's, it's, yep. It's, it's a recreation of Eden. Yep. That, that a fate. possible under, in this veil of tears, in, mm -hmm. under the sun. It's... Uh, it's uh, just a denial of reality. Yeah, I shared with you, I think maybe once time before, I found so so interesting as, as I was on that cruise for those couple of days, we're walking to the hall and there was some staff people and they were definitely fighting and they were bickering back and forth. And also they looked over, they stopped, they turned, they go, hi there, how are you guys doing? And they're just like, boom, on a dime. And I'm like, that was good. You guys are faking all the way through, right? You must get me paid very well to do that. <laughs> You know, and so yeah, so so the cruise is is fake. It's not real, right? That cruise ship is like that sweet water bowl. Yeah, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. You yeah. know, you think about that sweet water. We treat sin that way. It's our narcotic, and yet we go to the water, the baptism, but yet we can't go to cold turkey. So we're always fighting with that addiction. Yeah. So think about it. What do we do? We come in every Sunday, and we all stand up. I am a poor, invisible sinner. Da, 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 da. And then I what? I get to go to the font and I put my hand around the font. And you're getting invited. You're tucked back into your baptisms in the absolution. That's why I touched the font. It's like, it's like, get back in here, right? This is, you know, it's like, you know, come on back in. You get tucked you back into your baptisms. You're forgiven in Jesus, right? You're absolved. And you point to that font. And then what happens? All of us in the next week, we all wander away from that font and we what? We come back. I, poor, miserable sinner, you get tucked back in again, and again, and again, and again, until what? Until you're dead. And then you're free from that, right? Um, I think of uh, my previous church, uh, Ruth now, I think she's 101 now. And th th it was so amazing seeing Ruth s op with her hymnal open next to little Anya, when Anya was just a little girl. And they're both singing. They're both singing the liturgy, and they're both confessing sins. And here they're separated by over 90 years. And there's Ruth still confessing her sins and hearing the gospel in her late 90s. And that's epic. Okay, so, but does the ark really capture the church militant? It might be difficult to see the ark as an example of the church militant. An ark does not have any guns. It does not have any weapons. However, consider Noah's ark and the most successful battleship of all time. Which one had more wrath? Obviously, we conclude that the battleship. However, consider the ark. Through the flood, it is estimated that 750 million to 4 billion people perished through the flood. To the point, 
The church is a holy ark that keeps the baptized safe until the second coming of Jesus, when all things will be set right. Even in death, the baptized still remain a part of the church, the ark. Okay, We're one church with those who have died in Christ and those who are alive right now. We're one church. And so using this illustration of the church as an ark, the church militant focuses on several key features. So number one, we reject the world's ideas and solutions for cruise ship assurance, knowing that true safety is only found in the ark of the church. And so we reject the world's silly solutions for assurance uh, because we understand that the true safety is in the ark of the church where, I might add, the word and sacraments are found. We recognize, number two, they recognize that the ark had no motor, right? There wasn't a, there wasn't a Mercury 90 horsepower motor on that, on that ark, right? There's no motor. It was meant to preserve, not transport. So the same is with the church. It is a place of preservation and security, not a destination comfort cruise ship. Just as the Lord brought the ark to safety, he will do the same with the church. This is why we are called to abide in the church. Okay. Uh, we recognize, number three, that the church is not a battleship, but vengeance belongs to the Lord. Just as the mighty waters flooded the earth, God will enact vengeance on the world as he pleases and on the last day. We must keep in mind that the Lord cleansed the earth with water in Genesis, and he will also cleanse this world by fire, is what the Bible teaches at the very end. Fire will consume all things. Okay? He'll consume all things, but the church will be preserved from that purification because we're in Christ. Okay. Number four, we ignore the scorn of those who insist that the church is not relevant, as they are just as blind as the corrupt people of Noah's day. Okay, We're in the church. We belong to the Lord. We're in his ark. We're safe. If the world says the church is irrelevant, who cares? Seriously, who cares? I think way too often we worry too much what the pagan believes about the Christian when we should just say, well, that's fine, have it your way. You know, it, 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 we give too much attention to what other people think of us in culture rather than what the Lord says to us, okay? So if the world sees the church as irrelevant, so be it, okay? Number five. We resist the temptation of wanting to leave the ark with cabin fever or opening the doors of the ark during the flood, not realizing the spiritual dangers outside. And number six, we keep things in perspective. We do not sweat the small stuff, the smell of the animals, the color of the carpet, as we are grateful for the safety from the world's corruption and the mighty waters of the flood. Okay? And so I've said this before numerous times that there are no such thing, there's no such thing as an emergency in the church except for an emergency baptism. Otherwise, there are no emergencies. None. Okay? There's no emergencies ever except for, I would say, an emergency baptism. Otherwise, everything is what? Is small. We can take care of it. Okay? Okay, thoughts on those points there? In a word, the church is militant in that it rejects the world's corruption, ignores the world's scorn, and discounts the world's solutions and ideas. To be the church militant is to fear, love, and trust in God, not the world, not the devil, and neither the old Adam. What puts the church at war with the world, devil, and old Adam is that the church never gets with the program. The church never conforms. We do not deny the wrathful flood. We do not deconstruct the ark. We do not jump ship. We are sober-minded, confident in Christ, and unwavering in confession. We have comfort in the ark beyond a cruise ship. We have security in the ark beyond the battleship. Okay? This is what we hear over and over in Scripture. The word I love the word steadfast, sober-minded, awake, alert, right? Abiding, right? There's a sense where the Christian is awake, alert, steadfast, and abiding, in tune uh, to God's word in the midst of what? The flood around. Amidst what? The corruption out, out and abound. That makes sense? Okay, for sake of time, we'll, we'll finish this up when we talk about cap at recap. It sounds like the church is supposed to be a pacifist. 
Okay? Not really. First, it is important to keep in mind that being the church militant means that we recognize that the fights will come to us as we hold the line, remain in the ark. We do not choose our crosses, they will choose us. In other words, the crosses that we bear as individual Christians and as a church, they come to us. We don't seek them out. Okay? And so we, 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 we confess where we need to confess. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, the uh, Mind of Daily News has had several articles uh, as of late, and there's been some articles written by other pastors about LGBTQ and so forth. And so they spoke as religious clergy and as Lutherans. So when I read that, what did I, what was I compelled to do? You. Yeah, I was. I wasn't really necessarily that angry. I was just, just kind of like, I wrote. I wrote responses. Why? Because they were speaking with the title Lutheran, and they're not speaking for what? Me or you? So I spoke back. And uh, now, is that going to bring a repercussion to me? There might be. I might be somewhat blowback. There might be some what uh, some chastisement my way. Um, but so be it. If that's a cross that, that I have to bear, that you have to bear as a church, so be it. We are called to be what? Faithful, right? To be steadfast. So those crosses, they will choose us. Okay? Secondly, the church church's militancy is seen most active towards those operating from the inside of the ark. Okay? So if there's going to be um, any kind of militancy, it has to start where? By taking the plank out of our own eye first. Those who, there, there are those who try to open the doors of the ark, insisting that there is no flood. Those who would deconstruct the ark from the inside, those who grumble on the ark, and so forth. They're the ones that the church must be swiftest to condemn and confront. Paul, uh, actually, is it Paul in the book of Acts, chapter 20, it says, Beware of ravenous wolves who come from what? From inside. Okay. Um, we can spot an Antichrist from a thousand miles away that's out there, but the Antichrist, as the scripture says, it comes from what? From within. And so our, our attentiveness has to be where? Attentive to the inside, so we must be militant towards ourselves and our old Adam. Again, the devil's going to come into the details, and he's going to what? Try to infect from the inside out. Okay? So the militancy, I would say, first and foremost, has to be where? Here. What are the weapons of the church militant? Succinctly stated the word. What makes the church is believers gathering around the word and sacraments. And so the word is that which sustains the church, gives the church discernment, and wars against the world, the devil, and the old Adam. From the church we trust in the promises of God, not the empty talk of the world. All right. Okay, thoughts, feedback. We got about two minutes here as we consider this. The church as an ark. I have a question. Yeah. I'm usually pretty good with Ben Forrest, but number five, the the cabin fever and opening the doors of the ark, is, is that like um, if members introduce like kind of heresies that look nice and sound close, you know, like... Yeah. So what can happen is this. Um, discontentment can arise, and I've seen this in many churches where we can have the gospel right before us. And the old Adam, in our simple nature, we get bored with the gospel. Okay, We get bored with the gospel, and we look down the street, we see another church, and they've tried something, quote-unquote, new. And it's the cat's meow. And we say, well, you know, this church is doing it, and they're supposedly growing, right? So then we want to incorporate that into our own church in order to, what, make it better. And so when we add to the gospel, we actually subtract from it. And so that point there is that we must resist the temptation of somebody thinking that there's something else out there that's bigger and better, so we must open the doors to get that thing in. And ultimately, when we do that, we oftentimes allow what heresy to bleed within. And most of the time, there's been reasons, oh, well, that is based, okay, you know, we can make those exceptions. Yeah. I think it goes back to the lack of an understanding of depravity and understanding we don't deserve to be on the ark in the first place. Thank goodness he sealed the door. Yeah. 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 Thank goodness he sealed the door. We would be off. Yeah. Yeah. 
So when we look at this idea of the ark, um, again, the church is an ark of safety. It's a place of what? We're kept secure until what? Until the day that he takes us home and he what? Delivers us from this ark of the church into glory forever. Okay? All right. Okay, well, let's stand and pray, okay? I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Thanks, everyone.